pleasure to welcome um, Reverend Dr. Chris Baker, um, who was born and grew up in the West Midlands of England. And as an undergraduate, he studied engineering at St. Catherine's College, Cambridge, where he also gained his MA and his PhD. After spending some time working for British Rail in Derby, he moved back to academia, first at the University of Nottingham and then the University of Birmingham, um, where he taught fluid mechanics to several generations of civil engineering students. His research interests are in the fields of wind engineering, environmental fluid mechanics and railway aerodynamics. He's a fellow of the Institution of Civil Engineers, the Institution of Highways and Transport, the Higher Education Academy, and the Royal Meteorolog Meteorological Society. <laughs> yeah, it's a mouthful, isn't it? Um, he is the holder of the International Association of Wind Engineering Senior Award, which is known as the Davenport Medal. He retired in December 2017, but continues to work on various aspects of railway dynamics, wind engineering, and pollution and pathogen transport as Emeritus Professor of Environmental Fluid Mechanics at the University of Birmingham. And he's also started to work on some aspects of local history as well. I know him um, from my hometown of Lichfield in Staffordshire, um, where he is one of the priests at the church there, St. Michael's, uh, St. Michael, St. Michael and Greenhill in Lichfield, where he's been since 1998. So thank you so much, um, Chris, for joining us today. Um, this is going to be something very different for us to learn about, and uh, I hope you're going to explain everything, because I don't know anything <laughs> about science. So over right. to you. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Thank you, Joanne. I will uh, keep it deliberately, I'm about to say simple, that's not the right word. I, I will make sure I don't use too many equations and use lots of pictures. Uh, a journey around the fringes of aerodynamics, tornadoes, trees, trucks and trains. Uh, if I asked you what aerodynamics were about, you'd say it were about aircraft. Well, it isn't in my case, actually. Uh, the aerodynamics I'm more concerned about is the airflow in the wind, the airflow around vehicles in particular. So you'll see I talk a bit about tornadoes later and something about the airflow around vehicles. Uh, what I'd like to do in this talk is to uh, talk about three particular areas, or I'll come on to talk about three particular areas and that are nicely colour coded uh, that, I'll, uh, that I'm working on at the minute, basically. One is looking at high speed trains. Uh, one is looking at pollutants and pathogens in public transport vehicles. And I'll let you guess what pathogen in particular that might be. Um, and uh, looking also at tornadoes, trees, trucks and crops. And the latter is very much in association with folk in the US and Canada. Um, but those things don't come out of nowhere. This is quite a complicated looking diagram, so I'll, I'll keep coming back to. Uh, down the left hand side are the decades that I've been at this game. Um, on the bottom are the three things I'm going to talk about. And each of those three things have been informed by the things in the vertical bars that I've started at different times in my career, uh, I've worked on throughout the course of my career. What I'm going to do, I hope for about 20 minutes, if my timing works out, it may or may not, is to, is to talk through how I got to where I am now, and then perhaps spend 10 minutes on each of the things on the bottom line, just to give you a bit of a clue as to where I'm going. Um, okay, so there's Britain. Um, I was born and brought up in a town called Dudley in Worcestershire in the Midlands, an old industrial town, uh, very close to what can make a plausible claim to be the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution that affected the entire world. And you can see where that is off by the red dot, um, from which you can calculate my age, if you wish. Um, uh, I studied at the local schools, local, in your terms, public schools. Uh, and in 1972, I went to the somewhat greener environment of St Catherine's College, Cambridge. 
uh, and you, another red dot has appeared, I moved east. Um, and uh, there I studied engineering at undergraduate and at doctoral level. My doctoral work was on that. So I'm not going to talk much about that, except it's got some pretty pictures. Um, it shows the flow around the bases of cylinders. And we're looking at top left and bottom side on views. At the, at the top right, a plan view looking down from above. And you can see a vortex swirling pattern. And the right hand picture tells you why it's called the horseshoe vortex. Uh, that bends around the bases of obstacles. That was my uh, undergraduate career, my postdoctoral career. Uh, I then moved on for a bit to look at the Cambridge University Engineering Department, uh, uh, still in Cambridge, um, a little more industrial, uh, to look at supersonic flows around wings. And that is actually where I realized I really wasn't much into plane aerodynamics. So it didn't, it didn't sort of grab me terribly much. It was an okay job, uh, but I never really followed that up. It didn't, didn't grab me. Uh, and my first job outside the university sector was in a place called Derby, and I've moved a little north now, uh, at the what was then the British Rail Technical Center, the research center for the railways in Britain. And that was pretty much the view out of my office window uh, where you can see all the test trains there. Um, yeah, Jenny, I, li I do like the animal. That's nice. Get him to concentrate a little more on the screen, I think. Um, uh, so and there I actually worked on the aerodynamics of a train called the advanced passenger train. And in particular, the looking at whether or not this train would blow over in high winds because it it was de designed to run up some very exposed lines like in, you can see on the left on the right hand side there uh, and uh, so we did lots of aerodynamic stuff some wind tunnel tests i'll come back to that but this crosswind on trains is something that i've kept it going throughout my career in 18, 1982 i moved to the university of nottingham so i moved a little to the to the west of Derby um, uh, and there I kept that research on trains in crosswinds going, looking at the aerodynamics uh, of the shuttle vehicles running between Britain and France which are in danger of blowing over in the ports, uh, looking at the more modern Pendolino train and uh, doing some wind tunnel tests. But that is the first strand of my research. Okay. So that's been going since the 1980s, really. Alongside it, I also looked at road vehicles in crosswinds. It was a natural crossover, um, looking mainly at what I would call lorries. I guess you would be more comfortable with trucks, as the name for it, uh, doing wind tunnel tests, uh, full scale tests. And more recently, we've been looking at the risk of lorries blowing over on high span bridges like this bridge to the island of Skye in Scotland. And so there's another strand that goes back to the 80s. Um, I also began at that time to look at ventilation of things, of animal transport vehicles, ventilation of chicken transport vehicles, quite fun, uh, a bit unusual. Air in and out of them, I began looking at exhaust pollution from vehicles, ventilation of buildings as a idealized building and um oh now this is interesting oh, well done. sorry there is an animation there and that animation was meant to run but clearly something about showing it on zoom means it doesn't like to run but we will see that it ran when i tried it just before but you can't have everything can you you can't have everything uh and so again that's something else that goes back a long way in my career. Um, then in 1987, uh, Joanne will remember this, there's a massive storm in Britain when trees across Britain were flattened, major loss of trees. And out of that, myself and colleagues developed a research program that actually looked at the aerodynamics of trees and also the aerodynamics of crops. So um, 
we started looking at wheat blowing over, uh, what we call wheat lodging. Um, talk a bit more about that later. And we've carried on with that throughout the, throughout the time. We built wind tunnels and put them in fields and blown, the, blown wheat over in fields. Um, we've moved on to look at other crops, what we would call in this country oilseed rape blowing over. I think you call it canola or something like that. Uh, I'm not quite sure. Uh, looking at maize or as you would call it corn and building this around a sort of little mathematical model to predict what wind speeds and what rainstorm causes different sorts of failure of the crop. I say, don't worry about the detail, but that sort of cropped up in the 1990s, really. Um, in 1998, I moved to the University of Birmingham, my final move, and you can see, basically, I moved back to where I started, near, near enough. I've not been terribly adventurous in terms of location of where I've been during my career, really. Uh, always in the Midlands of England. Uh, and there's the University of Birmingham on a sunny day. It's not like that today. Um, and there I began to look at the slip streams behind vehicles, the, the wind produced by road and rail vehicles as they go by, uh, by looking at forces on portable road signs. Uh, looking at slip streams by trains. And I, we use something there called the train rig that I'll talk a bit about later. Um, and looking at the effects on people, or in this case, mannequin dummies as trains go by, um, and doing full-scale tests. A lot of my work has been actually making full-scale measurements, really. So uh, rather than doing anything else. And so that came up sometime around the 2000s. Oh dear. Sorry, I'm not sharing sound with you, but they came across very noisy. Um, what I wanted, uh, in about 2008, I started looking at windborne debris. And the picture on the left is, it's a storm, it's actually in the US. I don't quite know where, and you can see all the rocks that's moved about by the storm. And that's actually what does a lot of damage on them. It's not the direct wind storm, it's that sort of stuff trying to develop in that, not in the second place. Chris, Chris we can't give you a video. You have to get a piece of 2 by 4 go through mobile mm -hmm. home. And we started making some measurements of that, the measure of the field <laughs> uh, on... Uh, um, were you waving Sorry, Chris, we, yeah, we, we can't hear no, you over okay. the video. <laughs> yep, the um, we started measuring the, the forces on some of idealised plates, and there's a rotating plate we are measuring forces on. And if you look at this one, uh, you'll see after a while this uh, the small rectangle on the right hand side suddenly stops dry. Uh, as it moves down the winter, and we were measuring the forces on it as it flew along. These are really fun experiments, they really are, they're great fun. But that's uh, again uh, came up in the 2000s. I started doing more on railways around then as well, and one of the important things uh, on one of the important aerodynamic issues on railways, uh, high speed trains is that the ballast, the stones in the track, for under high speed trains going at 250 miles an hour, something like that, uh, start to lift off and can do great damage to the trains on, underneath. And so we started making measurements on that. Uh, and that again is something that's be, kept, us, kept me going over the years. Um, the work naturally led into looking at climate adaptation work on the railways, mainly and elsewhere as well. Um, it's not so much studies of climate change, but it's a given that the climate in Britain, at any rate, is measurably changing. And that is affecting significantly the number of windstorms, um, which blows trees down. The picture in the middle shows a container that's blown off a train on basically the major Lon London Glasgow line <laughs> there. Um, and you can see warped track in on the right hand side. 
and that's because of high temperatures and um, we've been working on ways of trying to um, adapt the railways to these slowly increasing temperatures which have become actually measurable and noticeable um, so that's another thing so you can see i'm almost filling up my uh, my timeline here um, in the um, last decade or so, uh, people began to realise that some, there were some really quite important windstorms we hadn't really looked at around the world. One was downbursts or thunderstorms where there are strong downward flows that come down and hit the ground and spread out. Uh, and we actually built a simulator of that. And there is, you can, this is a simulated flow around a building in a downburst. Uh, and you can see the little polystyrene beads moving away. And we've also been looking at tornadoes. Um, again, very much in collaboration with colleagues at Iowa State and uh, Western University, which I used to call University of Western Ontario in Canada. Uh, and we built a tornado generator to simulate these with a swirling flow. Um, more about that later. Um, but just to show that that churches aren't immune to tornado damage. That is a Catholic church somewhere in the USA again. Uh, and you can just make out the stained glass windows. Uh, hugely important area actually in, in terms of insurance losses, uh, both in, in the USA in particular, but Britain has also got, they tend to be weaker tornadoes in Britain, uh, but Britain has got as many tornadoes per square mile as the USA has but on rather a weaker level. So that's filled in that. And the last one, I became involved in looking at railway pollutants. Uh, Joanne might recognise that picture on the right hand side, which is Birmingham New Street Station, which is a horrendous, horrible underground station. And really with diesel trains in there, it was very unpleasant, and comfortable. And we were commissioned to make some measurements there. And those measurements were quite interesting, and I'll talk about those a bit later. So uh, all of that lot sort of comes together. And you can see how they sort of feed in to the three things I'm going to be talking about. Um, I think it's important to realise that because nothing that we do at the moment, it's all built on something else. Uh, inevitably so. And so we can't tackle actually the problems of pollutants and pathogens in trains and buses without the information that we've had for 30, 40 years. Uh, and it's, it's, it's just how science and technology works really. Um, okay, so let's move on. High speed rail aerodynamics. What am I doing here at the moment? Well, there's a high speed train. It's a it's actually a composite picture uh, of a German designed high speed train. I'm working on two things. One is the high speed railway between London and Manchester uh, that's being built in Britain. And I've also done some similar work for at your end uh, for the Federal Railroad Administration, uh, looking at trying to develop a, uh, a manual for high speed trains uh, for the Federal Railroad the FRA. Uh, what are the sorts of problems that we've got? Oh well, here I mentioned this. If we look at the top picture, this is my main experimental rig, or was before I retired. It's a rig that fires trains along a 200 meter long test track, uh, and they go pretty quickly, uh, as you can see. It's a sort of like a, a wind tunnel, except that we move the vehicles. Uh, the reason for doing that is uh, because we have to um, get the right flow between the train and the underground. Here is the record breaking rig when we fired it at full scale speeds, 80 meters a second, uh, which is Mach 2.5. And you don't see much of it, do you? Uh, going at that speed. Here it comes. Boop. Uh, they're, they're, again, they're really fun experiments to do. These are quite tricky. So we've got that, that we've got, we can now do computations of the flow around trains. Uh, 
we again do full scale tests and we've got loads of guides, uh, guidance documents that we can use. Um, so the, they're the techniques we can use. Uh, the work I've been doing is, there's a number of it. Um, when trains go by, if you stand by them, you can feel a, a pulse as the train nose goes by. And I'm not gonna show many pictures or figures, but on the top right, you can see time on the horizontal axis and the pressure suddenly peaking as you go, as the train nose goes by. And that's quite important because it can actually load platform structures uh, quite, quite significantly. So we've done some work on that for the high speed railways we're looking at. Um, come on, come on, come on. We've also looked at the issue of ballast flying up. Um, in Britain, the main problem is, you can see on the top right hand picture, uh, Joe, can you see my cursor moving over the screen or not? Um, no, if, if you can't, just shake your head. Uh, do, do it again no, for me. No, okay, I'll describe where I'll describe the pictures one by one then. On the top right hand corner, that's just a bit of track. And that bit of track has got a little hole in it. And that's where a piece of ballast has flown up from underneath the track, landed on the track, and then the wheel has come along and crushed it. And that can do a lot of damage to both the train wheel and the track. And actually, when you work it out in pounds or dollars, it's actually really quite an important issue. We've looked at that, we've made measurements on, of the underbody flow, looking at the bottom left-hand picture. Colleagues at the University of Southampton have actually instrumented a, a ballast stone. So I think that's a lovely idea, a bit of instrumented rock uh, that they can put into the, underneath the train, uh, record the forces on it and then take it off. And it's got a USB socket on it and you can put, the, a UA, put a USB stick into it, download it to a computer, lovely. Uh, we've actually done some experiments at model scale. It's very difficult on our, our rig to get up from underneath. So what we did was turn the train over and put a track above it so we could come through from the top. So you can see that rather weird upside down train there. So we're getting some better idea of what's involved there. In other countries around the world, in Europe, there can be some catastrophic damage caused by, um, by ballast flight. And it, there can also be similar issues with lumps of ice underneath the train. It's perhaps something that you don't think of as an aerodynamic problem, but it's a major issue in many countries. Another issue, um, uh, which those of you who've been on British trains will be only too well aware of, is when the train goes through narrow tunnels, there can be a pulse of pressure that can affect the ear. Uh, and here train aerodynamics meets human physiology. Um, and we've had to do some full scale tests, some model scale tests, some computational tests to try and fathom what the safe levels of pressure change are. Um, and that again is important for high speed trains. The work started in Britain and Japan in the 70s when we both, both countries started pushing through trains through tunnels that were designed and built in the 1850s and 1860s and are much smaller than the ones that are designed now. So, uh, such as the tunnel at the top right, top left there. Um, whoops. Okay. Yeah. Associated with that is something you might not, uh, oops, da, da, da. going on too far, uh, might surprise you. On modern high speed railways, when a train goes into the tunnel, it basically pushes the flow ahead of it and a pressure wave goes down the tunnel. Uh, and this pressure wave, when it hits, the, it gets, the pressure wave is quite shallow. It's a gradual wave at the start of the tunnel and it gets steeper as it goes down. And when it comes out at the other end, it can be quite a steep pressure wave. And as it comes out, it's effectively a sonic boom. It's like a supersonic aircraft going above you. 
Um, and it's bad news if you happen to be living close to the exit to a tunnel. There are a number of ways you can get around that. One is to uh, have your train nose very long and very thin, so that the pressure wave is very gradual. And that's the approach that the Chinese have taken, largely on the, on the bottom left there. Um, in uh, other countries, such as Japan and Britain, space is more constrained. And what we've decided to do is to build hoods at the entrance to the tunnels. And these hoods are large to start with and then become smaller and smaller. And they again spread out the pressure wave. Uh, and you can see at the top right there, it's something that was built in Japan uh, in the 1970s, 80s. And some work we've been doing for our high speed trains on the bottom right using our moving model rig. Um, now, I think I've mentioned um, trains actually turn over um, uh, and they've been known to turn over. Um, and the, I, the question that arises, can you determine the risk of an accident? That video you're watching is taken out of the window of a train as it turned over. It's Japanese, as you can see. Um, and that, uh, there were, I believe, a couple of fatalities in that. And there have been a number of incidents over the course of the years where trains have blown over. Um, low risk, low risk of trains blowing over, uh, but actually when it happens, it's catastrophic. And so we've been looking at that both for the um, uh, both for the new high speed line in Britain and for the FRA in the USA. Um, so there's our new high speed line going from London in the bottom uh, in the first instance to Bedford and to Litchfield, where both Joanne and I come from uh, at the top there. Uh, so Litchfield gets a mention, Joe. Sure. Um, and we've been predicting the risk. Um, and uh, this is something to take out of your mum and dad, Joe, that the riskiest place on the first phase of HS2 is going to be the viaduct at Litchfield. That's a place where it's most likely to blow off. OK. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and that work is, is a quite important work we've just finished. Um, train slipstreams. Um, when trains go by, not only do they pr produce a pressure pulse, but they produce a very strong airflow, particularly along the train side and behind the train. And we made lots and lots of measurements of that. The graph at the top shows the velocity of airflow along the train as the train goes by. And there's actually a peak in the wake as a rule. Uh, and again, oh dear. Uh, Sorry, my mouse has declared independence. Here we go. Um, the, there are certain levels of slipstream that you have to uh, avoid. And they're very unsteady flows, and you have to learn how to deal with them uh, through some sort of statistical analysis. But just to show you a couple of examples of where these can be important. A place called Twyford, which is near London, in 2017, on the platform, there was, as a freight train was going through quite quickly, um, um, there was a mother holding a disabled teenager in her wheelchair and the brakes were on. Uh, the mother, the mother wasn't holding the wheelchair as she had no particular reason to do so. And as, the train went by, something distracted her, she looked away momentarily, it wasn't her fault at all, and the wheelchair started to move. And these are, I'm afraid, very grainy pictures of the CCTV. The wheelchair was moving towards this freight train going at 60 miles an hour. Um, and mercifully, this wheelchair and the lass hit the train just at the gap between trucks and she bounced off and hurt her foot slightly. But she could have been, it could have been such a serious accident. And you can understand they wanted us to do some work to see what happened there. And in fact, we were able to show that even with the brakes applied, 
um, the slipstream from this freight train would have picked her up. There was no fault on anyone's part. Uh, as a result of that, people become more aware of this in Britain. And there was another instance as well, and I'm going to show you a video of that now, if that video works, at a place called Nuneaton, which is again in the Midlands. So I'm hoping this will start, yes. Uh, this is a, a real-time video. Passengers walk down the platform and you can see a mother with a pushchair. And she doesn't have her baby in the pushchair, she has her shopping in the pushchair, as I guess many mothers do. The train goes by and you can see it's going by fairly quickly. It's a big freight train and um, the push chair isn't being held and you can see what starts to happen by the slipstream from the train. And a little while, boom. Again, you think <laughs> so close, so close to something really horrible happening. But uh, an aerodynamic problem, a major aerodynamic issue that we're doing some work on. So high speed railway aerodynamics. Let's see where I am on my schedule. I'm even a little ahead of it, Joe. That's not too bad. Um, so um, coming on now to pollutants and pathogens on trains and buses. I've mentioned the station in Birmingham, New Street Station. 1966 to 2014, effectively a crowded underground station with diesel trains in it uh, that was quite, quite horrible to be in. Uh, the atmosphere was really nasty. It was rebuilt in 2015. Um, uh, it's much more spacious now, but there are still diesel trains going through and they wanted to do some work to work out how to improve the ventilation system. And so we we were called in to do some work on that. Um, now, another aspect of uh, ventilation is train ventilation, of course. And trains take in air from outside to the inside and recirculate it round. Um, and that is not necessarily a good thing when you have a very dirty environment, such as this railway station because you can bring in all the nasty stuff from outside into the train. And that was again, very noticeable. We did some work at uh, New Street. We made lo lots and lots of measurements um, using different sorts of instrument. I don't want to go into any details. And you can see there are 12 platforms in total at the station. We made measurements across the station. And I'll just show you some pictures again. <laughs> I hope these aren't too techy, uh, but understandable. This is for the entire course of our experiments between the 17th of November, 1711 in UK parlance is the 17th of November. Okay, it's the other way around from the way that you write it in the USA, as I found out to my cost in the past. Um, it, from the 17th of November to the 26th of January the year after, and we are measuring NO2, nitrogen dioxide, which is the prime thing that makes you choke. And you will have heard about particulate matter, I'm sure, these days, PM10, PM2.5, measuring both of them. On both of those lines, I put the annual averages uh, uh, that we're not meant to exceed uh, more than a certain number of times in a year. And basically, Birmingham New Street Station was exceeding any, any limit that you care to put on it um, in all for all species, really. But there's some, so just to make the, get those background measurements really interesting, but to um, just illustrate something, you should see some shading appear. That shading appears over the Christmas holiday. And for two days over Christmas, there are no trains. And you can see the pollutant levels drop right down, in fact. Um, then uh, another shaded area uh, in, well, around the 12th of January, uh, the, just after Christmas, when again the pollutant levels were low. And that was actually because the wind levels were very low. There was a high pressure sitting over Birmingham, 
hardly any wind at all, very cold, uh, and there was no wind to blow the airflow through the station. And then frustratingly, just as we were taking down the equipment, it always happens this, uh, we've got the highest wind speeds that we had, and that was, um, sorry, it's the wrong way around. Uh, um, I'm getting confused here, I do apologize. Uh, on the 12th of January, we had very high wind speeds, which is blowing the air through the station. Uh, right at the end, we had very low wind speeds. Uh, that was uh, So there was no airflow through the station, very high pollutant levels. Quite interesting stuff. Um, on the basis of the work that we did, other universities uh, made some measurements at other stations, King's Cross Station in London and uh, the large station in Edinburgh, Edinburgh Waverley Station, so in London and in Scotland. And um, although they were nasty and the, the red dotted line shows the legal limits, they weren't actually as nasty as Birmingham. So I think, you know, the station in the University of Birmingham was the worst of them all. It's actually a lot better now based on the work that's been done. But the story doesn't end there. Um, BBC did a study where someone called Tim uh, travelled by train on a commuter journey, then onto the London Underground, the tube, the subway, whatever you call it. And they found they had some massively high particulate levels that the passengers were exposed to. Um, it was actually better to walk along a busy urban road. Uh, than to go on the London Underground in terms of particulate levels. Not very nice at all. And these were backed up by um, the um, some work carried out in Korea in measuring uh, black carbon and very fine particles. Uh, the work on the left, again, it's uh, I'm not going to talk about the scales, but basically horrendously high values of particulates on the train. Uh, and this is because the dirty air around it was being sucked in through the doors, through the air conditioning system. Uh, so the obvious way around that is to say, well, we mustn't, we, we mustn't bring too much area from the outside, uh, uh, keep the air conditioning low. But, and the, sorry, some similar work in Greece. And this has led on to work that's actually ongoing uh, where we've been actually making calculations of the flow through something called computational fluid dynamics uh, of how the flow moves around trains from the train exhaust, because on diesel trains, the flow from the train exhaust can get sucked in to the train as well. But the overall message of this is you want to be very careful about your air conditioning systems on trains and perhaps minimize the flow. But then, uh, so an air conditioning system can suck in the exhaust, uh, recirculate it into the train and so on. And we looked at little models, little mathematical models of trains like that. But, and there's a but here, over the last year or two, it's been realized that if you're sitting on public transport and somebody, in that same carriage as you is infected with COVID, uh, then you want air conditioning to be as strong as it possibly can be. Um, and uh, that basic dichotomy is a difficult one because on the one hand, you want the air conditioning to be good, to keep the air clean and to move the infection. And in fact, traveling on public transport is not particularly dangerous if the air conditioning is good. Um, um, but at the same time, you're bringing in uh, issues from outside if you're traveling on urban highways, for example. And so the work that we've been, I've been doing over the last month or two has been looking at this. And this has been building a little mathematical model and looking at scenarios. So here's one scenario, and I show a little map uh, of a bus uh, going uh, from a bus station in the centre of a city, along some city roads, suburban roads, and 
urban and rural roads out into the countryside. And each of those will have different levels of particulates of nitrogen dioxide uh, and the like. And I've been assuming there's somebody on that bus who's infected with COVID. And I'm not going into any details again, because it's, it's, it's early work, uh, not profitable uh, to talk very much about it. Uh, but I looked at a couple of scenarios, really. Uh, one where you ventilated the bus by opening the windows front and back and side. And if you do that, you see the ventilated one is the red line. And basically, you can bring down the external pollutants, uh, nitrogen dioxide at the top, particulate 205 during the course of the journey. That works very nicely. Uh, if you ventilate it by wind, if you, so the black line is the ventilated line, if you ventilate it by windows, if you shut it, it's, it's not too important because you get some ventilation through the doors for, air, for nitrogen dioxide and particulates. But when you're talking about carbon dioxide that's produced by people or COVID that's produced by people, you suddenly see much higher levels if you don't have ventilation. And looking at the bottom right for COVID, that's up by a factor of two, the pathogen concentration. And basically infection is in the same proportion as concentration. So uh, it's early days with this work, but it's sort of designed to try and get some handle on what are the best ventilation strategies in the times that we live in. But again, going back, this work couldn't have happened without the work that we did on ventilation in the 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, it ties back into that. Um, which brings me on to the third of the, of the themes. Getting there, I spent a bit too long on that one, sorry Joe. Uh, tornadoes, trees, trucks and crops. Um, uh, now, these are all pictures from your part of the world uh, showing what tornadoes can do. Uh, that picture on the top left that we've just seen, I'll show you again, shows a pickup truck being lifted up. Uh, you can see somebody who must be absolutely insane trying to drive down a tornado alley on the right hand side. And the picture on the right actually shows a freight truck on a train blowing over. Uh, from a camera on the locomotive. Now, this um, clip has been cut off. It stops there. In the background, you can see how the train has become uncoupled. And the back of the train is now approaching the front of the train that has been slowed to a stop by the derailed wagon uh, at some speed. And if the clip were allowed to go on, you would see that hitting the train. So again, a very nasty accident. Tornadoes are nasty beasts, basically. Um, I'll show you that in a moment. Um, we built a tornado generator, and one of the fun things we did with it was to actually look at a, the forces on a train as it went through. So here on the, on the right-hand side, we have a model of a train. We let it go down a, a slope through our artificial tornado. So I'll play it again. So you'll see it go down the slope and there's a camera on the train, of course, and coming up the slope at the other end. I only do fun experiments. These are, are, are really entertaining. Uh, but we got some useful information out of that. Um, um, but basically, as in so much of the work that I've done, these start by making observations of tornadoes, uh, observations, experiments of the vehicle aerodynamics, putting those together into a mathematical model of a tornado model and of a vehicle in wind, and then putting that whole lot together to get some sort of risk assessment that can feed into design. Uh, you always want to come down to calculating the risk of an accident, whether or not an accident will occur. And so that framework is putting together that sort of framework is quite important and it involves maths and stuff, which I'm not going to show. Um, similar thing here. Um, I mentioned the work we did on trees. I've mentioned the work we've done on crops. 
Um, in the USA and in um, a large project that's going on in uh, in Canada at the moment, the, there is a, a need to be able to quantify the wind speed in the tornado. And this, once you've quantified what the wind speed was, you can use it in the design process to design buildings to be safe against a certain level of risk. So a building will only be damaged once in 100 years, something like that. And it's noted that when tornadoes go across trees or crops, um, they actually, unsurprisingly, blow them down. They cause, in our terms, uh, crops to lodge. Lodging is just a, a word for blowing over. And here you can see, and these are both from Iowa, uh, these pictures, uh, two tornadoes. And basically both of these tornadoes were from top to bottom. And you can see that the way in which the, the crop has fallen is actually very different in the two tornadoes, uh, very odd. But can we explain this? Can we use this to get some idea of what the wind speeds in the tornadoes were? That was what that was the problem that we were faced, and our colleagues in the US and Canada were faced with that we we did some work with them. Um, we made lots of measurements. Uh, we actually made measurements in crops, uh, looking at crops moving in the wind. And this this crop, I believe, uh, is these are oats, uh, oat crops. And we made these measurements in Ireland, in fact, and we were actually measuring how much the crops moved in the wind. Um, uh, we we're actually painting crops red, <laughs> a red target on one leaf and, and following that. Uh, that gave us lots of information. We put that together with our tornado information. And again, tornado field information, crop field observations, we developed a model to look at crop lodging or crop blowing over. We developed our tornado model. We put these in together and we managed to get tree and crop fall patterns. Um, and not only did we do that, we were able to say when a certain sort of pattern occurred, uh, then the wind speeds were at a certain value. So if you go back to the pictures that we've got there, um, then for the one on the left, we were able to get crop fall patterns for a, a tornado moving left to right that actually corresponded to that. That happened at a certain wind speed. Uh, and similarly, we were able to produce patterns on the right hand side that matched reality, gives a handle on the wind speed. So I'm coming close to the end now, so I'll, I'll finish shortly. Um, but one thing I, I do want to say that I probably haven't got across. It's been my privilege over the last 40 odd years to work in a field where I find a great deal of aesthetic satisfaction. And this is difficult to communicate. Uh, I find the flow patterns that I've dealt with, the flow around vehicles, uh, inherently beautiful. I find some of the train technology I've dealt with inherently very, very aesthetically pleasing. The natural phenomena I've dealt with and been in, the tornadoes, the crops, high winds, again, I find stimulating and aesthetically appealing. Perhaps obvious enough. Less obviously so is I find that sort of diagram on the right bottom right hand side actually quite beautiful. That we are able to take complexity and work it into something that's ordered and can be used usefully. And perhaps most for, furthest from most people's perception, I actually find something like that quite beautiful. That is the wind speed at which a crop will blow over in terms of the various parameters that define a crop. There are masses of approximations involved with it. Masses, I really do mean masses of them. But each of the terms in that equation describes something to do with the crop. And I have the privilege of working with some colleagues in Argentina. And the particular colleague there, Dr. Anna Scarabino, looked at that and she is one of the few people who I've 
ever felt understood what I feel, she looked at that equation and said, that is beautiful. I don't know whether I've got that across, ladies and gentlemen, but it's a field I've been privileged to work in. I hope I've interested you to some degree. And I end with perhaps one of the most beautiful mm. pictures I've seen recently. That is a murmuration of starlings in the shape mm. of a bird, which yeah. I think is wonderful. Uh, Joe, I'm going to stop screen sharing now. Okay. And Thank I'm you. happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much, Chris. That was an amazing talk. You, you need really to unmute, Joe. I am unmuted. 